Hi, so in the previous video we looked at a static propagation mechanism looking at intratemporal labour and leisure choices and choices about consumption and now in this one we're going to look at intertemporal propagation mechanisms so mechanisms that arise over different periods and where we're substituting our choices where we're deciding to consume different amounts in periods one and two or as I will denote in this video period zero and one so period zero is our current period so we're going to show a bit of intuition regarding the intertemporal propagation mechanism by starting with a two period model and then deriving the optimization problem of this individual so we'll begin with a utility function which we are maximizing so this is our utility function, very similarly, similar to the previous video where we have these isoelastic functions and as we said previously, they give us some nice results when we start to differentiate them. So we maximize this utility, which is increasing in consumption and decreasing in the amount of labor we use because we view this one minus labor as our leisure term and we normalize time to one. We've discussed this all before, so I will briefly or briefly skip over it. And then we are maximizing this two-period uh, utility function where we have some sort of discount factor beta and our functions are the same for period zero and period one. So this is period one and this is period zero and we're discounting at some time discount factor beta. And then we maximize these subject to our budget constraints or BCs. And so we have our period zero budget constraint and then our period one budget constraint. This isn't new. We derived intertemporal budget constraints using some something similar to this. So we just maximize with respect to our budget constraints in each, in each period of time. These budgets have to hold and we allow for some borrowing over time with this B0 term where we can either save B0 or borrow B0 across times. So to maximize and to solve this problem, we set up the Lagrangian. We have our objective function, which is our utility function, which is shown in this line here. This is our utility. And we maximize subject to our two constraints. So we have a Lagrange multiplier lambda zero for our period one budget constraint and another Lagrange multiplier lambda one for our period one budget constraint. And then we take first order conditions and we have a number of choice variables, five actually, in this model. Five things that the individual can choose. So they can choose their consumption in period zero. So we take the first order condition with respect to that. Their consumption in period one, their labor in period zero, labor in period one, and then they also choose B zero, which is how much they are going to borrow or save across periods. So I have already derived all of these. There's not too much I want to cover based on these equations, but we basically differentiate with respect to our five choice variables and then set them equal to zero. And then I've rearranged each of them to give something that we can then use in our when we solve start to solve these simultaneously and just mark them equations one through five so i won't comment on these too much but these are the outcomes we get out i won't even draw a box around all of them but yeah so there are those are our five first order conditions and yeah as i said with respect to labor in period one and our borrowing or saving and then we get two more equations which are just the constraints so we differentiate with respect to lambda naught and lambda one i won't write them down again because we, we already wrote down the constraints above we just get those solutions out of the equation so as we always do when we're solving a lagrangian we then substitute some equations into each other and we are going to look to derive some results from these equations to then get some intuition out of this and how we get our propagation mechanisms out. So the first equations I use together are equations one, two, and five that we just saw. 
and if you were to do this working yourself you, you could get out these results um, what we basically do is we we're always using equation number five which uh, this is this equation which basically so we've differentiated with respect to our borrowing and saving and we get out a nice relation between our two Lagrange multipliers lambda naught and lambda one that lambda naught is equal to lambda one multiplied by the interest rate in period one so we we always use this when we're substituting things together because if you notice in our equations one and two well we have got a lambda naught and a lambda one here so we need to basically just get it's such that both of these equations have the same lambda in terms of each or in their equation and then we can just substitute into each other to solve simultaneously for some result so we do that we substitute them into each other and we get out this result which is c1 over c0 is equal to this function of the discount rate the interest rate and our sigma which is our sort of constant in our isoelastic um, utility functions and so we get out this result which is actually the Euler equation and so we've strategically chosen which which uh, equations we substitute into each other so that we have period one consumption and period two consumption and then we get an intertemporal relationship between consumption over time and this is what our Euler equation says so this equation says that changes in the future interest rate which is R1. If we change R1, then, and this will arrive because, arise because of an expected productivity shock, so it will come from, for example, increasing our A parameter in period one, or we might denote this as Z parameter, but our productivity parameter, we have a shock in the future period, and this will change our decision to save and invest. So, for example, if we were to Oh, I've actually written this down here. So if we were to increase our R, or here, more accurately, R1, then this would decrease our consumption in period zero, or it will decrease consumption today. Why, why is this a substitution effect? Well, so we're increasing the interest rate, which means we incentivize our saving because we have got a higher interest rate. So if we save today, we earn more for our savings and the converse of this is that if we were borrowing it would be more expensive to borrow so we're going to decrease our borrowing either way an increase in saving today is going to reduce our consumption today so this is our substitution effect uh, that is changing the interest rate is effectively increasing the price of consuming today however we also have an income effect that is somewhat shown in this equation or that we can illustrate here so let's consider that we have an increase in R1 and let's imagine we are a saver so we are initially a saver and we have an increase in the interest rate this is going to increase our income because all the units that we're saving we are earning higher interest on them so this increases our income and so we're going to increase our consumption. I'll just put that cons. And I've done a video on intertemporal macroeconomics before saying for savers, if we increase the interest rate, they're going to increase their consumption. However, this is not always a positive income effect because imagine we increase R1, but we are a borrower. And it's not rocket science to realize if we're borrowing and we increase the interest rate, it's going to become more expensive for us to borrow. So we are effectively reducing our present value of income because we have to pay more in interest and that's money we can't spend on consumption. So we are then reducing our interest or our income even, and this will reduce our consumption. So we have a substitution and an income effect that is shown in this Euler equation. So if we increase the interest rate for a saver, they are going to um, reduce their consumption due to the substitution effect, but they're going to increase their consumption due to the income effect. So it's unclear what the actual overall effect on consumption is going to be of changing our interest rate. However, if we are a borrower, 
well, the substitution effect is going to reduce consumption and the income effect is also going to reduce consumption. So for a borrower, the increase in interest rate is going to unambiguously decrease our consumption in period one. So that is the effects of changing the interest rate given by the Euler equation. <coughs> so again, our change in productivity can have a knock-on effect on our choices regarding saving and consumption, and this can have a further effect on income. But I'll come back to this point after we derive a second equation in which we go back to our first order conditions from before, um, but this time we use a few different equations. Again, we're using equation five, which you'll remember was saying that lambda naught is equal to lambda one multiplied by the interest rate. So we sub can substitute that into four or into equation five, and then substitute three into four, and we get out this condition here, which is our intertemporal labor and leisure choice. So before we had an equation in terms of consumption in period one and zero, now we have an equation of labor in period one and zero. And so this equation is giving our relationship ad optimum between our the amount of labor we use in each period. So again, we can imagine that we change something in this model. So this should be an R1 here in this equation. So consider that we increase our relative wage today, and we could view this as a temporary productivity shock. So we increase A0 and we keep A1 the same. Uh, so we have an increase in productivity today, which will then cause our relative wages in period zero and period one to increase. So if we increase our wages today, well, we're going to want to increase our work today because we're getting a higher return on our labor that we give today. And so then we can just work lots today and then save that and then increase our consumption in both periods. And so increasing our work today is going to also cause an aggregate effect on output. Why is that? Well, we showed it a little bit clearer in the previous video, but we let's assume that we have this sort of relation in our, this is our aggregate economy. I know all the first order conditions we've done up to now have been looking at individual optimization, but what we do in this model is we look to see how this has an overall aggregate effect. So this is our aggregate economy. Our output is just given by a very simple productivity parameter A multiplied by the amount of labor we have going or working in the economy. And maybe more accurate, we use a capital L to show that this is an aggregate variable. And so if we have a shock to the economy where we increase this A, well, then this is going to increase Y, and we have an immediate increase in output from the shock. So this is the impact of our shock, but what I'm thinking about in this video is our propagation mechanism, and this is the indirect effects that we have from this shock. And what I'm saying here is that if we have this increase in A, as we see at the top of the screen, this is going to cause an increase in relative wages. This is assuming that this is a temporary shock. If it's a permanent shock, we won't necessarily have this increase in relative wages. But yeah, so if we do have this increase in relative wages from a temporary productivity shock, we're going to increase our labor today. Our labor in period zero at the micro level, which we've just derived the result to show, which means that we increase our labor at the aggregate level because this is just a representative consumer we're looking at in our optimate optimization problem. So this increase in L, well, this is going to feed into our aggregate equation here. And so it's going to increase our output again. So we have this initial shock from the increase in A, which is going to increase Y. And then we have this second effect from the increase in L, which is going to increase L and then further increase y, and this is our propagation mechanism. Our model is telling us that our shock is going to change individual choices and further increase output. And so this equation we have here, 
also shows us another possible effect where if we increase the interest rate in period one and again and this will come from an increase in our productivity parameter a1 then this will increase again our work today and it will increase our output so this is another propagation mechanism we have where if we increase our interest rate for whatever reason usually coming from a shock to productivity this will increase our amount of labor we offer and then further increase the output more than our initial shock predicts so this is a propagation mechanism so if we go back to this Euler equation again what what we were deriving before was saying that these these effects were going to change our saving and consumption patterns well if we if we say for example decide to consume more today because of the Euler equation then that's going to boost our output and if we decide to save as a result of it this is going to depress our output today because we're saving it however saving can mean investment and this can mean an increased investment in the capital stock and so we can boost our future income by increasing saving today but that is going to be a topic for another video but so the general idea that I was trying to get across in this video is that our shocks may be amplified by our individual household decisions to work and invest so work which was this example here this is how our work propagation mechanism works and we discussed a static labor decision in the previous video and as I've just touched on now we can also have through the Euler equation a decision to invest so if we decide to save more because of a shock well this is going to mean that we increase our capital stock in the future and so we can increase future growth through this so that's our intertemporal propagation mechanism that will just about wrap up this video make sure to like this video if it was at all useful that was meant to be a thumbs up make sure to check out the playlist for future videos and we will be continuing in the line of real business cycle models in the next video and do subscribe for plenty more future videos